high damping factor, so it usually isn't that much of an issue. But as soon as you start moving into slightly more exotic amplifiers, valve amps, particularly set amps, some of Nelson's designs and a few others, uh, Nelson passes sort of first watt and Zen amps, uh, it starts becoming more significant, which is no bad thing, uh, but uh, it's something you do have to think of when you do it. Even down to your wires, the speaker cable. Now, um, I'm not in the total belief in the speaker cable camp, nor am I uh, totally anti them. Uh, I view it from an electrical perspective, purely. And there's some speakers that Colin and I uh, do together, a friend of mine, Colin Tops. Um, we did one called the Eddingdales. Big, big floor stand there with fat driver job. Uh, and uh, we put them on the end of that Tellurium Q cables and thought, where's the high frequencies gone? They disappeared completely. Second, we put them back on a normal bit of zip cord. Oh, look, there's the high frequencies again. It's, it's quite a high inductance cable, so bye bye, there goes the top end. Uh, so, you know, you need, to think, you need to think about these. It's about system design. Speaker design is like anything else, it's really it's system design. Uh, if you want to get the best out of it. Aesthetics! We all say, oh, blow it, yeah, that doesn't matter. Yes, it flipping does in most cases. <laughs> You've got to consider this. Uh, I'm, I'm not married. I'm, I'm 38 at the end of the month, and I'm still stuck with my parents because of the situation we have with our wonderful government and uh, the lack of money that universities get, which means that my what would have been my, my, my primary profession is a sort of case of has now all practically become a hobby and what had been my hobby is now my profession thanks thanks to Mark. If it hadn't been for Mark and Kill, I would have, personally I would have been stuffed. Uh, you know, that's, uh, that's the way of it. So um, yeah, you have to think about these things. Aesthetics. You know, whose house is it going in? Uh, who else lives in the house? Are they going to be perfectly happy with seeing a set of... You know, Avalon speakers, mm. you know, uh, up to 30 grand. Yeah. Am I alone in thinking that they look like coffins? <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, you know, the, the heavily chamfered baffle. Yeah. Yeah. Now, for, certainly from a technical perspective, yeah, fantastic lights, it's a really good idea. Um, from an aesthetic perspective, I don't want to look at coffins. You know, uh, it's, it's a personal taste. I, I, I'm not a goth, <laughs> you know. Uh, and, it doesn't, not everybody thinks, oh look, there's a coffin when they see it. <laughs> when they see something like an, um, I don't know, whatever, however you pronounce it, I don't know actually. And I have nothing but respect for some of the engineering those guys put in, which they do put a lot in, particularly the crossovers. Uh, but, you know, these are considerations you have to make. And you can't just ignore them. Uh, this, is, this, is, this is life. And all of these points, and some more, which you can think of yourselves, they should inform your choice of the drivers that you're using. With the greatest will in the world, uh, uh, sort of positive will in the world, Mark, uh, if you want to fill uh, this size room that uh, your mate Graham has down in New Zealand, which is what, about 45 feet by 30 feet, with a cathedral ceiling that picks up to nearly 20 feet, uh, it's not going to do it. You know, I think, and it, the crackest thing is that so many people, I, I see it all the time, go piling in and they don't really think about what it is they're trying to do. Uh, so, you know, please, please do, <laughs> is the phrase. So, um, vented boxes, I'm not, I'm, I'd love to talk about horns and transmission lines and all that, but it ain't going to happen in the time we've got available so, uh, today, sadly. Maybe another time, though, if you're interested. So we'll stick with the vented boxes. They are the most popular type of speakers, along with sealed boxes, and they are so for a good reason, because they are relatively straightforward in terms of the sizing, and they do produce, for a lot of people, good performance. Um, it's, you know, you almost say, oh, it's just another bass reflex. Mm, is it? Uh, this is, it's an interesting point. Bass reflex is almost a sort of an e dirty word among some people I know over in Canada. Dave and Chris bless them. Uh, it's like, oh no, it's, it's a bass reflex, it's horrible. It's a, mm. And there's other people who swear by them as the only thing that, oh, yeah, it's, as usual, the truth is somewhere in the middle. Um, you can get interesting variations in bass reflex boxes as well. 
Uh, but even the simplest types, it's a single vent, you know, which is nominally the simplest type, can give you a lot of flexibility and a lot of useful output and capacity. They are no more or less than a compromise, like anything else is a compromise. And they are, generally speaking, the one that I would, if you're new to designing speakers and you actually want to get on it and design them, I would, don't do what I did. I started out with horns and transmission lines, the hardest ones you can possibly encounter. Just because I thought, oh, that was quite interesting. Um, and I only actually started designing fancy boxes, uh, reflex boxes, uh, afterwards. And I actually, in a way, that was a, I wouldn't recommend doing it that way, but it did, if it was one, if there was one thing it taught me is that um, what appears to be just another vented box, just another base reflex, isn't always the case. So, vented box designs, what I'm doing here is that you can get, you can all go away and get sort of WinISD or Unibox or whatever, and sort of run the numbers with it. And most of them will spit out a mathematical alignment, which you can then change. Uh, what I'm doing here, or trying to do here, is suggesting ways that you can then manipulate these to get what would be, in practice, likely superior performance. So, vented box designs, go at running through quickly, other than in sort of very large room, uh, rooms where the chances are that those boxes will be pulled well away from any boundaries walls, apart from the floor, obviously. Um, a mathematically perfect flat alignment, QB3, uh, quasar butter with third order roll-off, ultimately it will transition to a fourth order roll-off, because all vented boxes of any type ultimately will transition to a 24 decibel per octave fourth order roll-off. Initially they might be slightly different, but it will ultimately transition to that. Um, QB3 is a, is a sort of popular one. Keel's modification of that, mathematically, the flat as the lowest possible uh, flat free, tuning frequency. They're generally not very practical, unless, as I say, you can pull those speakers well out from the walls, uh, any walls, be it side walls, front wall, whatever. Uh, they will be bass heavy. They will boom. And not only will they boom, chances are it'll be over a very narrow bandwidth. So you'll tend to get this sort of one note thumping sound that just uh, drive you crackers. Uh, if, you actually end, if you end up with something like that, uh, the traditional foam uh, vent bungs or an old pair of socks rammed into the uh, vent tubes often works wonders. Uh, it certainly helps a bit with that, just reducing the output. There's another point of that which I'll mention in a minute. So, maximally flat designs ra are rarely very practical. Um, unless you actually want that, just one note thumping, and let's be honest, not many people do. So, you've got a number of options then, with this. Um, for a practical base reflex box, you could use an extended base shelf alignment, EBS. Basically, it's an oversized box that's then tuned quite low. So, what you'd get is... Um, at a relatively high frequency, maybe about 300 hertz, so it depends on the specifics, you get a fairly shallow roll-off, you know, which will then stop rolling off and level off as a sort of flat plateau before it commences its final uh, roll-off at quite low frequency. They, for some reason, the ABS boxes seem to have got quite a rather bad name. I don't quite know why, but it's actually a rather sensible idea. Uh, they do often work well. Uh, the issue with them is that they can often get over large, uh, phys just physically too big for people uh, to use practically. And also, because they're large, you have a limitation in uh, power handling capacity. Now, that actually depends on exactly where you've tuned them, because for all vented boxes, the point the point of maximum excur excursion uh, is not where people think it is. Uh, I'll actually throw it out to you guys. Uh, does anybody actually know where the point of maximum excursion in uh, 
of this reflex of rented boxes. It's an octave above the tuning frequency, which can get a little bit alarming. You see, what, and your average reflex box is probably tuned to low to mid 40 hertz regions. You know where the maximum energy in most rock music and a lot of other uh, electronic music is? The 60 hertz to 120 hertz region. <laughs> So all of the bass energy in that music is in 60 hertz to 120 hertz, and that happens to be the region where you've just chew, uh, got maximum excursion for your flipping box. Not ideal. So, <laughs> so yeah, there isn't a great deal you can do about that other than keeping that in mind. Um, what I generally try and do, if we're dealing with a straightforward ducted vent reflex box, the pencils are a bit different to this, so uh, I guess they're not they're not the traditional type bass reflex. Um, what I generally do is I'll have a look at what the normal recommended volume, as in enclosure volume, of the box is. I could, whatever it is, say it's 15 litres. What I will then tend to do, that's for a sort of flat alignment like keels or a QV3. And what I find tends to work rather well is if you then, say, reduce that by about 10% and then lower the tuning frequency by another 10% or so compared to the QV3 or key alignment, flat alignment. So you get a slightly smaller box than that that's sort of spat out by the mathematically perfect flat alignment that's also tuned a little bit lower. And what you then get is a lightly damped alignment, more or less lightly damped alignment. It just gently rolls off, more or less smoothly. It depends on the specifics, obviously, of what you're doing. Um, that works in practice, for me at any rate, a lot better than a perfectly flat, nice mathematical alignment. Uh, the price of doing that is whenever you try and squeeze bass out of a small box, the group delay, the ringing, goes up slightly. It'll, it'll last a, bit, a little bit longer. Uh, personally, I think that's a price worth paying, because group delay on these, particularly if it's moderately low tuned anyway, and somewhere in the 40s or whatnot, um, it's not at low frequency. Our hearing acuity drops off dramatically below about 200 hertz. So, at relatively low frequencies, we're not that susceptible to it. And you'll get more benefit from that than having a big booming one note bass. If it's a choice between those two compromises, personally I think that is a compromise that is well worth making out just a touch higher group delay, but having a much, much flatter in practice cabinet and speaker alignment. So that's the sort of response I looked for. Compared to the sort of flat alignment, that's about three litres reduced in uh, total cabinet volume, and it's uh, tuned about four or five hertz lower. And you can see from the black line there and the blue and the dark blue line here, two different bits of software. The scales are different, as you can see on the graphs, but these shape of the alignment, that sort of gradually drooping alignment. Yeah, the dark blue line here, or the black line. As soon as you get that near a room boundary, that pulls itself much more into line. This is, the dark red line here and the light blue line here is also something I'd um, briefly mention as well. Uh, that's it. that's the box tuning, that's the vent output. And you can see it sort of rises and then gradually sort of decreases. I would generally recommend you try, if possible, it's not always possible, but a sign of a good box tuning is usually when you've got a fairly smooth, broad curve like that. If it's a really steep like almost like a triangle going up, very very narrow tuning, 
very narrow tuning. The vent only operates over a very much tighter bandwidth and produces mm -hmm. maximum gain over a very, very tight range like that. Again, that's often a symbol or a, a little warning sign that that box is tuned very narrowly and you're at risk of getting this sort of one note thumping sound, especially if it gets anywhere near a ring boundary, because chances are it'll just start peaking up. Now, what does that mean in practice uh, with these alignments? Well, remember that um, graph I showed you with the, big, uh, with the red line showing the actual sort of massive peaking of about 10, 15 decibel peaking. Same conditions, same box. I've kept the box position the same, but I've shifted to this slightly smaller box volume and a lower tuning on here, and you've suddenly, yeah, of course, there's always ripple in it, but you've suddenly got a much, much flatter, smoother alignment going out of it. Okay, so if you're focusing on designing a normal ducted vent bass reflex box, Okay, I wish I could go into some of the some more exotic alignments today, but I really can't, if, you, if I want to be hearing any music. Um, sadly, I, that's a good option, in my view. It's the personal view, people, if you want to disagree with it, fine, no worries. I'm simply giving my take on it, and what I've found to work best uh, for me. Um, certainly, it seems to have done in practice for a lot of people who have built some of my designs. So that is... That's a, an alignment I would, actually, generally speaking, advocate. Just consider a slightly smaller box and a slightly lower tuning frequency, because in practice, if it's anywhere near a wall, you'll probably get better results. So, uh, I mentioned the sort of maximum excursion point. It's a point to bear in mind. Usually people, um, you might want, when you get that, it's, ju it's just, it's something you want to remember if you're, considering building a new design and your staple diet happens to include a, a lot of heavy rock. In which case you might need a slightly bigger, if you, I'm working primarily with single drivers here for the purposes of this, uh, it might indicate you need a slightly bigger driver uh, than you would otherwise be considering. You know, there's, it's just points to keep in mind. Um, the influence of your construction materials is usually worth considering. Ply, I would recommend like that over MDF. Um, but it can, and this point can be overstated. Uh, if it's a choice between building an MDF or not having a speaker, I know what you, which I'd rather go with. Uh, you know, it's, uh, there are a few forumites who would say, oh, I'd rather not have any music. Oh, grow up. It's ridiculous. Uh, but yes, I mean, this. Oddly enough, MDF is brilliant for mid-range cabinets and uh, tweeter cabinets uh, because its resonant frequency is much lower than the bandwidth they'll be operating over. Uh, for base cabinets, Baltic finished birch, I think this is, isn't it? Yeah. Finished birch ply, a really good quality bamboo ply, same sort of thing. They have a massive stiffness to weight ratio. Yeah, it's Absolutely it's ideal. Juicy hardwoods if you've got the money. Yeah. So some of the really good hardwoods, tight grain, avoid knots. I, I, <coughs> I have to disagree on the hardwood bit. <coughs> Building speakers out of hardwood is... is um, it's a nightmare. It's a nightmare. Obviously wood's designed to... Uh, you know, not, not designed, you know, it's you know, an organic thing, obviously, but it moves. And, uh, you know, do, yeah, do, do an engineering right. joint in something that moves. Yeah, it's, is, a, it's uh, a nightmare. It's My mate, obviously a nightmare, so I've had yeah, know, don't a few it. friends that have gone to me and said, oh, well, speakers have got a big spit down the middle. Yeah. Like, what, what do you think's happened? Yeah, oh. it's, it's just, <laughs> it's, well. the, it's the movement, it's the ceiling. Unless you know exactly where that hardwood has been and you're an experienced cabinet maker, stick to sheet materials is my, is my message. My mate Greg built um, a wonderful pair of, speakers out of um, pine, soft pine. <laughs> it had been soft. It's, uh, it was 150 years old. It had been used in barn in Georgia. It had never seen a drop of rain. It was bone dry, sealed it up, and it had a stiffness to weight ratio like aluminium. It was incredible stuff. Uh, but Greg knew exactly what he was doing. Uh, he worked with this all his life. He's in his 70s now. Uh, 
So, <laughs> unless you're an experienced cabinet maker, you've got to be a bit wary on that. Yeah, so 